Hello, and welcome back to Technology Now, a weekly show from Hewlett Packard Enterprise where we take what's happening in the world and explore how it's changing the way organizations are using technology. We're your hosts, Aubrey Lovell. And Michael Bird. Now, in this episode, we are taking a break from the norm to bring you a few of the amazing stories from the world of science and technology that haven't quite made it into the podcast recently. And our goal is to bring you a lot of amazing stories and important Mm. technological developments on this podcast. But the little stories in the middle where we take a break don't always get the attention they deserve. So this week, we're bringing you some of those stories from around the world that haven't quite made the podcast yet. And of course, you'll find details of all the stories we featured today in the show notes. Now, don't worry, this isn't a regular thing. We'll be back to normal next week. So if you're the kind of person who needs to know why what's going on in the world matters to your organization, then this podcast is for you. And if you haven't yet done so, do make sure you subscribe on your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out. Right, Aubrey, shall we, uh, shall we get into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, I'm going to start us off because I've got a pretty exciting space story for you, Michael. Mm. So NASA has teamed up with the Japanese Space Agency and a major Japanese car manufacturer, more famous for its hybrids than its spacecraft, to build the next generation of Moon and Mars rovers. And this time, it's not just going to be an open-top go-kart. It's a six-wheel mobile base. The lunar cruiser is 5.7 meters long, 5.19 meters wide and 3.6 meters high. So that's roughly 18 feet, 8 inches by 17 feet by 11 feet and 10 inches wide. It'll contain a mobile laboratory, a pressurized atmosphere and bunk beds for two astronauts with enough life support for a month on the surface of the moon and in later versions, Mars. The rover will have an incredible 6,200-mile range from its onboard combined hydrogen fuel cell and solar panels and be able to survive in the moon's extreme temperature variations from negative 170 degrees Celsius to over 120 degrees Celsius. It also uses AI and spatial mapping to plot safe routes across the surface whose monochrome appearance makes navigating and avoiding obstacles tricky. It's hoped the craft will be ready for launch by 2029. Whether there will be a lunar mission for it by then remains to be seen. But how cool would it be to see that thing rolling across the surface of the moon? That is very, very cool. Thanks, Aubrey. Right, one from me now. And I've got a question for you, Aubrey. If you had a robot helper in your house, would you want it to look more like a human or more like, you know, sort of a robot? Definitely a robot. I think it would be weird Mm. if it looked like a human. Okay. Well, a survey of more than 8,000 people across Europe and North America agrees with you because uh, the survey suggested that, in fact, we want robots to look, well, like robots. Big news here, obviously. Now, the survey covered the G7 countries and found that over 60% of people want to have visual distinction between robots and humans. Delving deeper, the research found that 80% of people were scared of more humanoid robots threatening their jobs, whilst over 70% thought that it was likely would be socializing with robots at some point in the future. Interestingly, but maybe not surprisingly, people were very much in favor of humans maintaining control over robots and were in favor of keeping and expanding robotics in areas where it's already prevalent, for example, medical research and manufacturing. But it became a muddier picture when people were asked about robots in new areas. For example, the US is the only country in favor of introducing robots in primary schools and nurseries, with 50% supporting. Canada, Italy, France, and Germany in particular completely rejected the idea. So it's kind of a silly piece of research, but it does raise some interesting questions for future design when it comes to ergonomics and the way we present and interact with physical technologies. Interesting. Very interesting. Mm, Yes. Well, now I've got one for you from Finland. So a factory which has recently opened and Vanta claims to be the first in the world to be producing food from thin air, kind of. It sounds like a lofty claim, but it's an interesting story. The factory called Simply Factory 01 uses heat and carbon dioxide mixed with tiny amounts of nutrients to grow vast swaths of edible protein-rich microbes. 
It's thought that the single factory, which has been built in part due to tens of millions of euros in funding from the European Commission, will be able to produce up to 160 tons of cheap, nutritionally complete protein a year for just 1% of the water and 5% of the land of traditional plant-based agriculture, while creating only 20% of the emissions. Wow. So being produced in a factory and needing little more than air and electricity, which can be generated on site, it's hoped that microbial proteins will be able to be grown in deserts, unconnected communities, and in dense urban environments, improving global nutrition while reducing food miles, water use, and emissions. Now, there's a slight blocker right now in that the protein is only certified for consumption in Singapore, but the manufacturers hope to get a load more approvals this year. Thank you for that, Aubrey. And uh, sticking with thin air, scientists in Birmingham here in the UK have found a way to potentially ease the effects of climate change, at least temporarily, by increasing the amount of clouds in the sky. What a thoroughly British solution. Researchers working on the issue of global warming have been looking into something called marine cloud brightening or marine cloud engineering, which works by increasing the amount of cloud cover to create more of a cooling effect for the planet. The way scientists have proposed doing this is by squirting tiny particles of aerosols into the atmosphere, which would mix with the existing cloud to create more cloud area, which in turn reflects more sunlight away from Earth. In Australia, there have been experiments carried out using marine cloud engineering in an attempt to prevent the sun bleaching the Great Barrier Reef. And experiments in cloud seeding, creating more clouds with the hope of generating extra rain, have been going on since the 1940s. That said, it's not an exact science. Obviously, you need to allow for the natural amount of clouds around in the first place, and putting more stuff into the atmosphere could potentially come with its own problems. So for their experiment, the scientists from Birmingham created a natural experiment. When the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii erupted, the research team studied the interactions between the natural aerosols it kicked out on clouds and the climate. They used machine learning and historic satellite and meteorological data to predict how the cloud would behave when the volcano was inactive. That helped them identify the impacts on the clouds directly caused by the volcanic aerosols. The results, which are published in the journal Nature Geoscience, showed cloud cover increase by up to 50% during the periods of volcanic activity. However, even if more cloud cover can positively reduce the effects of global warming, it's clearly not a long-term plan. In fact, the scientists have called it a painkiller that could at best act temporarily whilst we humans work on decarbonizing the planet. Well, that's good and bad news. (laughs) Okay, let's go from above the clouds to beneath the waves and potentially great relief for me as a Floridian because there's been a development that could potentially help save scuba divers or surfers from being eaten by sharks in the form (laughs) of a new e-glove. And this is really interesting to me because actually I have grown up in the shark bite capital of the world. I don't know if you guys knew that. No No way. Yep, New Smyrna Beach. Google wow. it. Have Have you ever seen a shark in real life? Absolutely. All the time. <gasps> no way. If you, really? surf, if you surf in the jetty, they're always there. I'd say nine oh. times out of 10 when you're surfing, you will see a shark. They're smaller, right? The sand sharks, but they're definitely there. So this is interesting story on my part. So they are gloves that are fitted with sensors that translate electronic messages into information. They're already being developed to allow the wearer to interact with VR situations or to help people regain motor skills after a stroke. But now researchers have developed a waterproof version with wireless technology that will enable divers to relate that hand signal digitally rather than rely on visual cues alone. Now, the current danger is that if there's a shark swimming towards your dive partner and the water is murky, they may not be able to see your hand signal before the shark strikes. Similar dangers exist when, for example, rescue diving, exploring wrecks, or in underwater welding or construction. Now, with this technology, the hand signals can be translated into messages that can be sent to a fellow wearer and even up to a boat on the surface. Interesting. However, according to the report published in the journal ACS Nano, making an e-glove waterproof is trickier than you may think. 
Anyone who has used electronic tech underwater will understand that it's not the easiest thing to do, especially when you're looking at motion sensing or touch control. So the researchers behind the glove designed the sensors based on the microscopic pillars that are found in the tube-like feet of starfish. Then they used lasers to recreate the starfish feet on a thin film of waterproof plastic, usually found in the production of contact lenses, stuck it to the outside of the glove, and coated it in silver so that pressing them together created a signal. After that, a machine learning technique translates the sign language into words, which can be relayed by a computer program. The e-glove was tested both on land and in the water and had a 99.8% accuracy, which when the waterproof e-glove goes into manufacture will mean good news for divers. Yeah, not so much for hungry sharks though. Anyway, finally for today, the dilemma around energy usage in machine learning and AI is a well-known one. In fact, we've had an episode of this podcast about that very subject, which we've linked to in the show notes. But now it seems that humans are actually less energy efficient than AI models when it comes to writing and illustrating. A study by a group in Kansas has compared established machine learning tools to humans. The study, published in the journal Nature, found AI systems emit between 130 and 1500 times less carbon dioxide per page of text than human writers. Similarly, the tested illustration systems produce between 310 and 2,900 times less CO2 per image than humans. And if you're wondering how you can compare a human's energy use to that of a computer, here's how. So to get the human energy reading, researchers consulted the human energy budget, which measures the amount of energy in calories used in certain tasks for a set period of time. So if you consider how much energy a word processor uses in an hour, when multiplied by the average time it takes a person to write a page of, on average, 250 words, you can get a fairly good idea of how the two compare. And for all it might sound like the research findings don't bode well for us humans, the people behind it did make a very valid point. And that's about accuracy. As AI advances and more language models are trained, they use more and more energy. There is also more room for hallucinations, copyright, and privacy infringement. So for now, at least, they suggest the ideal solution is for humans and AI models to work together in perfect harmony. Lovely. Thanks, Michael. I feel like we've learned a lot today, haven't we? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. What an awesome show. A nice little break from the norm. Aubrey, thank you so much. And listeners, you'll find links to all of these stories in the show notes so you can do more reading and research. Enjoy. All right, we're getting towards the end of the show, which means it's time for This Week in History, a look at monumental events in the world of business and technology, which has changed our lives. Now, the clue last week was, it's 1980, let's get connected. It's a bit niche, but it was obviously the birth of Ethernet, woohoo, which was formalized as a standard this week in 1980. Aubrey, I don't want to give too much away about our age, but it was basically a decade before you were born, wasn't it? Yes, yes, it was. And it's still around, my goodness. Anyway, it was uh, formalized by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, and they launched Project 802 to standardize local area networks, or LAN. Though, as we all know, Ethernet was originally privately engineered in 1972, obviously, as we all know. Now, the first standard was published on September 30th, 1980 as the Ethernet, a local area network, full stop, data link layer and physical layer specifications. Aubrey, it really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Brilliant. Now, version two came out a year later, but it wasn't actually standardized until 1983 as IEEE 802.3. Whoa. And the rest, they say, is history. Aubrey, what do we have next week? The clue for next week is it's 1906. Come fly with me. Mm. So a pretty straightforward one this time, I think. Not I, sure. Yes, yes. I know that. I think I know that. Oh, I'll say no more. I'll say no more. <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Technology Now for this week. Thank you to all of our amazing scientists and researchers doing incredible work around the world. And to you, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Now, Technology Now is hosted by Aubrey Lovell and myself, Michael Bird. 
And this episode was produced by Sam Datapoulin and Al Booth with production support from Harry Morton, Zoe Anderson, Alicia Kempson, Alison Paisley, Alyssa Mitchery, Camilla Patel, and Chloe Suwell. Our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Now is a lowest street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and we'll see you the same time, the same place next week. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.